Tony Shea became an incredibly rich man by selling his startup, Link Exchange, to Microsoft for $265 million and his shoe company, Zappos, to Amazon for $1.2 billion. Shea was known for his incredible generosity and unusual business practices. And like most incredibly wealthy people, Shea grew a cult-like following of yes-men and enablers. Shea had started out revolutionizing corporate culture, but eventually began self-medicating to deal with his anxiety. But self-medicating never works out, and Shea worked his way up to inhaling up to 50 small canisters of laughing gas daily, becoming reclusive and detached from reality. Shea became convinced that he was able to download skills directly to his brain, like Neo from the Matrix and that he had the ability to turn into animals. One day, Shea was found on his property, sitting by a lake totally emaciated, rambling to 90s icon Jewel about hacking sleep, not needing to eat, and having an algorithm for world peace. Inside his mansion, literally hundreds of candles were burning with wax and dog feces littering the floor and clear instructions not to clean up either. Obviously, his friend was concerned. When she finally left, Jewel warned the head of security that if Shay passed in a huge fire and took everyone in the house with him, they couldn't say they weren't warned. As the founder of Zappos, Tony Shea didn't just sell shoes. He transformed the way people shopped and connected with brands. Zappos' motto, create fun and a little weirdness, perfectly stated the values of the company. The offices were a burst of color, creativity, and whimsy. Leading the charge was Tony Shea, the embodiment of a special kind of CEO. With an umbrella twirling in hand, dressed in jeans and a Zappos branded t-shirt, he guided visitors through the vibrant workspaces. Under Shea's leadership, Zappos Zappos' ascent was nothing short of remarkable. Taking the reins soon after its inception, he guided the company from near collapse after the dot-com bust to a billion-dollar acquisition by Amazon in 2009. Jeff Bezos, in a video message to Zappos employees during the acquisition, praised the company's unique culture and brand, emphasizing his commitment to preserving these invaluable assets. Shea's impact extended beyond the confines of Zappos. He envisioned a transformation of downtown Las Vegas into a second Silicon Valley, investing $350 million of his own money to infuse the area with creativity and innovation. He aimed to replicate the strange and alternative culture of Burning Man, a festival he frequented each summer. In 2014, Shea embarked on an experiment, implementing what he called a holacracy. This radical management structure aimed to decentralize organizations, empower self-managed teams, and eliminate traditional hierarchies. The shift was monumental, replacing bosses with self-management and introducing Producing new rules and titles. With a fortune nearing $1 billion, Shea spared no expense in ensuring that every Zappos worker felt valued and cherished. The company allocated millions of dollars annually for extravagant parties, family gatherings, and happy hours, all orchestrated by a dedicated team known as the Fun Engineers. These events transform Las Vegas nightclubs into circus-like spectacles or immersive movie replicas, showcasing Shea's commitment to fostering an atmosphere of fun and excitement. In 2016, Shay's path crossed with that of folk singer Jewel, known for her 90s hits Foolish Games and You Were Meant For Me, who had transformed her tumultuous upbringing into a journey of self-discovery and mental health advocacy. Shay's connection with Jewel was immediate, leading him to approach her with a unique proposition, develop a program at Zappos that would address stress and mental health, preparing employees for the demands of the holacracy system he had introduced. It became apparent that Shay's interest in mental health went beyond Zappos' workforce. Jewel's team recognized that Shea himself was grappling with issues of social anxiety and stress management. As the pressures of his skyrocketing fame and responsibilities mounted, Shea struggled to navigate his own well-being. He sought solace in an Italian liqueur, Fernet, drinking it throughout the day. Jewel's collaboration with Shea extended beyond the workplace. His participation in the program she developed remained indirect. He sought book recommendations about mental health and engaged in deeper discussions on the topic. However, as Jewel delved into more intensive retreats and workshops aimed at addressing personal struggles, Shay's presence dwindled. Shay's trajectory during the pandemic was marred by a tragic descent. As he embraced a party-centric lifestyle 
at his new mansion in Park City, Utah, it became a haven for a plethora of guests, ranging from actors and artists to government officials. Shea's ambitions stretched beyond the ordinary, with a desire to solve world peace driving his interactions. Yet, his wild parties and gatherings also served as a backdrop to his struggle with addiction and deteriorating mental health. These gatherings, characterized by extravagant celebrations, also underscored the widening gap between Shea's reputation as a visionary leader and the mounting challenges he faced in his personal life. Shea experimented with various illegal substances and pushed his boundaries to the extreme by attempting to forego sleep, oxygen, and even food, resulting in his weight dropping below 100 pounds. The disintegration of his well-being was evident to those close to him, with friends noting things were falling apart. As his health faltered, Shea's life took on an almost cult-like dimension, with him being perceived as both a Howard Hughes-like figure and a cult leader. He accumulated properties under the name Pickled Investments, reflecting his lavish lifestyle that included purchasing condos for friends and investing in various businesses, even offering down payments for future meals at local restaurants. Tony Shea's personal assistant, Mimi Pham, emerged as a central figure with a controversial role. Pham, often referred to as Shea's right-hand person, had become an integral part of his world, overseeing crucial aspects of his life. Initially paid a flat rate of $9,000 per month, along with travel expenses, Pham's compensation quickly escalated. By 2020, her pay surged to $30,000 a month, accompanied by a 10% commission on any funds she managed or invested on Shea's behalf. This commission spanned an astonishing array of areas, leading to a multi-million dollar increase in her income over a single year. Pham's influence extended far beyond financial management. She reportedly engaged in an envious feud with another of Shea's associates, Susie Bailson, who was also receiving commissions. To counter this, Pham drafted a peculiar contract stipulating that she would be paid $30,000 for every day Bailson spent on Shea's property. Beyond questionable financial dealings, Pham allegedly crossed boundaries boundaries by monitoring Shea against his wishes through a camera installed in his bedroom. This intrusion into his personal space showed a deeper level of control that had manifested. One of the most shocking allegations revolved around Pham's involvement in securing a $10 million contract for documentary projects. The contract purportedly benefited her boyfriend, Roberto Grande, a lawyer. Under the terms, the profits were funneled through a company owned by Pham and Grande, allowing them to take a significant cut. Amidst these challenges, a critical turning point in emerged in February 2020 when Shay's friends intervened, persuading him to seek help in a rehab facility. This decision was an attempt to break the cycle of his self-destructive behavior, catalyzed in part by his associates in Las Vegas who had been fueling his addictions. Although Shay embarked on this journey towards recovery, the aftermath of his rehab stint revealed that his inner demons still held a grip on his psyche. By May, Shay had developed delusions of possessing psychic abilities and the capacity to levitate. In an effort to restore his sense of well-being, his close friends organized a therapeutic bus trip to a ranch in Montana. Shea boarded the bus wearing nothing but pajama pants and clutching a box of crayons. He stark contrast to his previous self. His transformation was evident in his penchant for conducting meetings clad only in underwear, a behavior he had never exhibited before. Shay's vulnerability became evident through his actions during this period. He offered exorbitant sums of money to friends for seemingly trivial tasks while under the influence of hallucinogens. The bus ride to Montana unraveled into a nightmarish episode. Shay's mind, distorted by the effects of the contraband he'd been taking, led him to believe he was trapped in an active shooter situation, prompting him to physically destroy his beloved tour bus. Even more disturbingly, he proposed a pact to his friends, suggesting that he would set the bus ablaze with everyone inside. As 2020 progressed, Tony Shea's life was spiraling into the abyss, marked by a mix of obsessions and manic visions. His downward trajectory reached a disturbing climax as he experimented with various substances and indulged in behaviors that signaled his increasing detachment from reality. Shea's addictions had spiraled out of control, and he began inhaling a gas known for producing momentary euphoria. This shift was accompanied by a dangerous fascination with fire, leading him to play with fire and perform risky magic tricks involving candles, even placing them precariously on his bedspread. His room was adorned with over a thousand candles and a small
small firing shot flames into the air without restraint. The mansion itself mirrored his tumultuous mental state. When Jewel and her team visited in August, they were confronted with an astonishing sight. The property was in disarray, with hundreds of candles causing wax to drip onto furniture, carpets, and countertops. Shay's small terrier mix, Blizzy, had left droppings intertwined with wax throughout the space. Signs explicitly instructed visitors not to clean up, reflecting Shay's unconventional philosophy that discarding trash contributed to environmental harm. The mansion was a reflection of his belief in living in harmony with nature, a sentiment reinforced by leaving showers and sinks running constantly to mimic the sounds of waterfalls. Brightly colored sticky notes replaced electronic communication plastered on walls, glass doors, and windows. The property became a microcosm of his struggles, as even basic amenities were reimagined in bizarre ways. A stream that once flowed naturally was rerouted to the patio, repurposed to serve as a so-called natural dishwasher. The luxury of electricity gave way to an ethereal landscape of hundreds of candles and tiki torches, a spectacle that triggered concerns among local authorities. The nocturnal ambiance was marked by the constant chime of smoke alarms. In the midst of this surreal reality, the mansion bore witness to incidents that reflected Shay's escalating instability. In one episode, Episode, Shay accidentally cut his foot on glass. Instead of tending to his wound, he chose to walk around the house. This gesture seemed to symbolize his quest for connection, even through pain. As his mental and physical health plummeted, the mansion became a battleground for Shay's relationships and finances. The Shay family's lawsuit indicated that Pham began asserting control over his assets, claiming he was running out of money and imposing the idea of charging rent at his properties with a 10% commission for herself. Even Shay's own brother was locked out of his own house, coerced into paying rent against his wishes. Friends and family intervened, pleading with Pham to take action before it was too late. The Shea family's lawsuit alleged that a close friend implored Pham, acknowledging that Tony was on the brink of passing away. However, Pham's response was chilling, a dismissal of his impending fate, viewing him as an adult with the autonomy to make his own choices, regardless of the recklessness they entailed. Jewel's visit exposed the extent of Shay's deteriorating mental health. She found him outdoors by a small lake, sitting in a lawn chair with only his boxers on. His skeletal appearance was striking as he sat surrounded by many gas canisters he'd been inhaling. In a moment of urgency, she revealed a box containing a seemingly random series of numbers, which he claimed was an algorithm for achieving world peace, a manic vision that hinted at his distorted mental state. Shay's revelations continued. He declared his intent to start a new country and proclaimed that he had hacked sleep, no longer needing it. Jewel recognized that Shay's visions weren't merely eccentric ideas. There were cries for help from someone grappling with a severe mental health crisis. At the mansion, Jewel confronted the troubling atmosphere and those around Shay who seemed indifferent to his deteriorating condition. She questioned their purpose and their seeming lack of concern. Despite the deplorable state of the property and Shay's obvious distress, most individuals around him treated his behavior as normal, a sentiment possibly encouraged by Shay himself. He had told his new employees that he was undergoing a creative metamorphosis and that his sobriety would be the final stage. Jewel's parting words to the property's new head of security revealed the gravity of the situation. She warned that if Shay's destructive behavior continued unchecked, it would end in disaster. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how Scott Storch lit $30 million on fire. Tony Shay's journey reached an end as he succumbed to injuries sustained in a fire at his residence in New London, Connecticut. On that fateful day, first responders rushed to the scene of a blazing three-story beachfront home shrouded in darkness at 3.30 a.m. The residents bore witness to a storage shed where dark smoke emanated, marking the origin of the fire. Within this tumultuous scene, a somber connection to Shea's recent struggles emerged. Witnesses told the first responders that Mr. Shea was in the shed, prompting a frantic effort to break down the door and quell the flames. The language used by the responders painted a grim picture, one of a man barricaded within. It was a scenario that bore unsettling resonance to the prior warning by Jewel. The fire's aftermath revealed the true extent of the situation. Mr. Shea had been rescued from the blaze, with first responders undertaking life-saving efforts as they performed CPR on him. He was subsequently transported to the Connecticut Burn Center in Bridgeport, where his fight for survival continued. Despite the medical team's best efforts, Shea's condition deteriorated, and he ultimately
unfortunately passed away. When reflecting on Tony Shea's final moments, it's crucial to approach them with compassion and empathy. His struggles with addiction, mental health, and the search for meaning had clearly taken a toll on his well-being. We all have at least one person in our lives struggling with one of those things. And as is often the case with the supremely wealthy, they find themselves surrounded by people who are also more interested in what they can get rather than how they can help, like Mimi Pham. Shay's breakdown was enabled by the people who were around him, and despite his clear need for help, he never truly got it. He just got stuck with people who only said, okay boss, whatever you want to do. Scott Storch was a music producer who worked with icons like Beyonce, Long May She Rain, Justin Timberlake, 50 Cent, and Christina Aguilera. Scott Storch also blew, or rather inhaled, over $30 million in six months. Storch was the producer behind some of music's biggest hits between 1999 and 2006, and in the process developed a costly addiction that would suck up all his earnings. Storch made $100 million over his career, but that money went fast. The hit producer filed for bankruptcy several times, having spent most of his money pretending his nose was a vacuum cleaner. He also got in trouble with Suge Knight. Scott Storch grew up in Long Island, New York. His father was a court reporter and his mother a singer. Storch came from a musical family. His uncle Jeremy founded soul rock band, The Vagrants. When his parents divorced, a 10-year-old Storch moved to Florida with his mother. His high school was tough, and in the middle of his first year, Storch moved with his father to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. They had family nearby, including Storch's cousin, who introduced him to the world of music. Storch was soon producing his beats and breaking into the music scene. By 1991, he was the keyboard player for the well-known hip-hop group The Roots and rose to stardom. He contributed to several Roots albums like Organics and Do You Want More? Despite his success with the band, Storch was sick of the band's packed tour schedule. He preferred being in the studio instead and decided to build a career in music production. As a producer, Storch worked with the top names in the industry. He'd already produced hits by The Roots before he worked with Dr. Dre on his hit Still Dre, where Storch played the piano that provided the catchy soul of the single. The hits skyrocketed Storch's career, which led to collaborations with 50 Cent, Chris Brown, Snoop Dogg. He saw himself as a chameleon and cared more about good music than the genre. Storch admitted he enjoyed the challenge of being pushed to work on styles that he hadn't done before. Storch produced hundreds of hit songs like Candy Shop by 50 Cent, Justin Timberlake's hit Cry Me a River, and Me, Myself, and I by Queen Beyonce. In 2005, Storch had produced over 80 tracks and was at the top of his game. He would sell each track for $100,000. Storch's biggest hit financially was the song Lean Back that he recorded with Fat Joe's Terror Squad. The song didn't just make him a massive amount of cash, but also proved his talents as a songwriter. In 2006, he won the ASCAP Songwriter of the Year Award. With all of his success, it was time for Storch to create his record label, which he named Storch Music Company and opened a music production company called Tough Jew Productions LLC. He was a top award-winning music producer, but his issues with nose beers was growing out of control, and soon his career, much like his septum, would begin to crumble. Storch's lifestyle completely changed when he became rich and famous. He amassed an elaborate car collection with 20 high-end luxury luxury cars costing between $250,000 and $700,000 each. He would wake up, indulge in his powdery habit, and go to the car dealership. Storch had a Bentley, Ferrari, Maybach, Bugatti Veyron, Lamborghini, and a limited edition McLaren SLR. He bought at least 10 of his vehicles while under the influence. In 2005, he dated heiress and socialite Paris Hilton. Storch blamed her for introducing him to the party scene, which later absorbed his life. We know, you're like, Paris Hilton, the socialite? There's no way someone of her solid moral character would ever introduce a susceptible young man into that kind of party scene. We were just as shocked to hear it, but this is straight from the man himself.
The couple worked on Hilton's debut album, Paris, together. They met in Miami and spent most of their time together in the studio, where they became very close. Life with Hilton was unlike anything Storch had experienced before. They were hounded by paparazzi, would take trips to exotic places, and partied hard. The pressure of working with such a high-profile celebrity backfired on the producer, and the pair broke up. Storch took a break from music, and his newly elevated social status meant everyone knew who he was. After his split with Hilton, he was linked to her assistant at the time, Kim Kardashian, someone who was way less game-hungry. In 2006, Storch bought his $10.5 million mansion on Miami's exclusive Palm Island. It was a waterfront mansion with nine bedrooms, an indoor pool, a movie theater, a fitness center, a spa, and a game room. In total, the property was a whopping 30,000 square feet. He parked his $20 million yacht, which had four bedrooms, in front of his extravagant house. Storch also loved expensive jewelry and owned watches costing $100,000, necklaces, and many more shiny displays of excessive wealth. He treated his girlfriends to millions of dollars of diamonds and wore a $7 million, 32-carat canary yellow diamond ring on his left index finger. When he traveled, he preferred to take his private jet and would drop $250,000 each way to bring his entire entourage on vacation to the French Riviera. Storch dropped over $250,000 a month on partying alone. Well, not alone, like he was alone because that would be weird but alone as in just on party for scott storch party rock was in the house every night and it cost eight grand by 2006 storch's net worth hit 70 million dollars he should have been financially set for life but the allure of the party scene and his love for luxury goods would be his downfall he completely stopped working and partying turned into his full-time job storch's miami mansion was the perfect place to enjoy the lavish side of life and while he spent huge amounts of money on extravagant things, nothing compared to what he put towards his nose candy. Storch's reputation was crumbling. He became unreliable, and in 2007, actually made Janet Jackson wait 10 hours at the studio so that he could finish partying. The party stops for no one, not even the least creepy Jackson. Artists were no longer interested in working with a music producer who had stopped prioritizing his work. Word got around, and Storch found himself with more party time than he expected. By June 2008, Storch was behind on his child support payments and failed to attend the hearing. At the time, he also owed the government $500,000 in property taxes on his lavish home. With his legal troubles mounting, Storch checked himself into a rehab center. While he was trying to get his life back on track, the bank repossessed his Palm Island home and sold it to Rockstar Energy Drink founder Russell Wiener for $6.75 million, much less than Storch paid. While Storch's income might have slowed down, his spending did not. In 2009, he had blown through his $100 million fortune and had to declare their bankruptcy. But the legal problems didn't stop. He leased a 2004 Bentley GT in February 2006, and the terms of the agreement stated he would return it in March 2008. Storch broke the lease term, and the Bentley's owners, the Atlas Leasing Company, claimed his actions cost them $65,000 in revenue. Police arrested Storch in Miami and charged him with grand theft auto, although they later dropped the charges. Aspiring singer Trina Ruberg paid Storch to produce her album. When the time came to start recording, Storch wasn't. Let's just call it awake enough to get the job done. Ruberg had agreed to pay Storch $45,000 to produce six songs for her and paid $30,000 of that money up front. She sued him when he wasn't able to deliver. Storch accused former Death Row Records CEO Suge Knight of bullying him into handing over songwriter royalties for a portion of their worth. Knight, currently serving his 28-year prison sentence, had collaborated with Music Royalty Consulting Inc. for the deal. Knight allegedly coerced Storch into signing over the royalties while under the influence of his favorite powdery substance and made Storch fear for his safety due to Knight's intimidation and threats. According to legal papers, Knight forced Storch to participate in the transaction where Storch received a fraction of his music's worth. Knight dragged Storch to his office to sign the contract despite Storch being unrepresented and under the influence. Additionally, Knight took the majority of the nominal payments Storch received. Knight most likely knew that the hip producer was down on his luck, battling his nose beer problems and financial hardships. At the time, Storch's most valuable assets were the rights to future royalty payments for songs he had previously produced. Storch sold the publisher's share of his royalties.
royalty rights for $2.3 million to Reservoir Media Management. He wasn't ripped off in the original agreement, as the royalties were worth the same amount. Instead of receiving $2.3 million for his separate songwriter's royalties, he was screwed over. Storch and Knight lived in the same gated community, giving Knight a front row seat to Storch's struggles. He took the producer from his home to the officers of MRCI for a meeting. After Storch signed over his writer's royalties, they gave him a $5,000 check, which Knight claimed more than half of. Storch received another check for $58,000, but Knight threatened and intimidated him into surrendering over half of it to Knight again. In total, MRCI paid Storch $429,306.20, but Knight allegedly bullied him out of over half of his earnings. Storch filed a lawsuit against MRCI, asking they return the writer's share of his royalties. Sounds like he got off easier than Vanilla Ice, who Knight allegedly dangled over a balcony for similar reasons. Real estate moguls Brad and Seth Cohen learned of Storch's downfall and wanted to help him get back on his feet. The businessmen earned their money through real estate and insurance holdings and signed a million dollar deal with Storch using their own money to fund Storch's comeback. Brad and Seth hoped he would use his connections in the industry and prove himself once again as a hit music producer. As part of the deal, the brothers paid him a weekly salary, provided him with a rental house in Park Lane, Florida, and gave him a Rolls Royce ghost. The terms of their agreement stated that if Storch failed a drug test or showed signs of falling back into his old party house, Habits, they would take away the Rolls Royce. The vehicle was under Scott Cohen's name, and when the Cohens discovered Storch was back to baking but only using flour, they wanted the car back. Scott feared it would be an insurance liability if Storch continued to drive it. The disagreement over the Rolls Royce would lead the Cohens' relationship with Storch to dissolve. By June 2015, Storch filed for bankruptcy again, valuing his music company at zero dollars, and in the filing stating he only earned $10,000 in 2014. The legal paper said he only had $3,600. Storch had $500 worth of clothing and a $3,000 watch. By that point, he only had $100 in cash. Storch worked on rebuilding his life and revamped his public image when he started Storch Labs, joining the green rush by entering the marijuana industry. He also started working in music again and was a part of hits by DJ Khalid, Rick Ross, Snoop Dogg, The Game, Chris Brown, French Montana, among others. The scene had changed dramatically since the height of his career. People stopped buying albums in the record store and few owning physical CDs. Storch was contending with a much more saturated industry where music was much more accessible but not always good quality. However, Storch knew he could still be a pioneer in creating hit-making material. Some of his best-known recent projects are DJ Khalid's Every Time We Come Around, Snoop Dogg's Happy Birthday Part 2, Rick Ross's Supreme and Sorry, and the game's All Eyes. Storch has admitted to his struggles, particularly in 2014 and 2015, when he was in a different headspace. Storch claimed he was on solid ground after no longer flying the powder plane and was taking his music far more seriously now than he had a clear head. Celebrating his sobriety, Storch has worked on new projects with music's top artists and returned to doing what he loves, being in the studio and making music. Today, his net worth is $250,000, a fraction of his fortune during the early 2000s, but far more than it was at the time of his 2015 bankruptcy. We hope he lays off the nose jobs. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section which website you spend the most time online shopping, other than Amazon.